Welcome to the channel. In this video, I'm going to show you how to use the combination plane. Now, I know this is the Veritas combination plane, but you can also apply these tips and tricks to the Stanley number 45. Stick with me. If this is one of your first times setting up a combination plane, or maybe you've had one before and you're still really struggling to set it up, the first recommendation I'm going to have is take it apart. So take the fence off, the skate off, and the body. Take everything off of these rods so you can work with each piece separately. Once you gain more experience with the plane and you start knowing these parts and you know what you need to do, then you can leave it mostly assembled. A lot of times you take this side of off to change out the iron, whatever. But if you're learning, take it apart. It's going to be a lot less stress. You're going to have more access to things because if you're trying to set the depth stop right now, it's through here. you got to move the fence or whatever. Take it apart. There's nothing wrong with that. So that's what I'm going to go ahead and do is take this apart and then we will look at each piece and how I set up each piece. All right, so first... We'll focus on the rods. So, for these, what I recommend, wax them or oil them. Put something on them so things slide easier. Now, I use Johnson's Paste Wax. I know, I'll, I'll let you do the, oh, he's got Johnson's, okay? If you don't know, Johnson's Paste Wax, wax was discontinued and these cans are selling for just a crazy amount of money. I think the record I saw was one went for $75. It, just crazy. Um, I get it. I love Johnson's. It's amazing, but $75? I don't know. Anyways, so I'm still using it. I don't care. Um, I enjoy using it, but once I'm out, I'm not going to cry. But you guys can yell at me down below. Maybe you're like a huge fan of Johnson's, whatever. But this is what I'm going to use. So... What I do is I just have one of these. This is actually like a sponge for a car for waxing. I just use one of those. Rub it onto the rods. There you go. Then what I do is I take the clean side. Because I don't want it too caked up that it's going to jam things. Because sometimes with Johnson it can be in clumps. Like you can actually get see how it just like clumped up like that. That can happen and it can jam into those rods and create some issues and just look nasty. So just clean them off a little bit. You don't need to put a lot on there. Next, we're going to look at the fence. Now, I don't know why I put the Johnsons away because I'm going to use this again. <laughs> so for the fence, one of the things I do is I actually wax the fence itself. So just take a little bit of this again. And the reason for that is, oh, see, I got the chunks. Good enough. So the reason I'm waxing this is because this is going to ride against the wood and I want it to be a little bit smoother. Um, Mike, you probably should have sanded this a little bit more, buddy. It's a little rough. <laughs> I could sand it for you, but I don't have time. So put a little Johnson's wax on there or whatever you got. Plus, it makes it look like it's got a nice finish to it. You know, let's just go all the way around. Make it look nice and pretty for him. All right, and then I'm going to go to the clean side. Maybe. There we go. So for the fence, there's not really any other setup other than waxing it, but I will point out, this is a micro adjust fence. Some of the Stanleys also have a micro adjust. What you want to do is retract this in because if you set up your fence and then you realize, oh crap, I need to micro adjust it. If this is already advanced, you don't have as far to go. You won't be able to move it as far against your piece to micro adjust it where you need it to be. So just retract this back in. For the Veritas, it's righty tighty brings it back. I always forget. There we go. Lock it down. That's pretty much it for the fence. The next part I'm going to look at is the skate. Now, there's three different things we need to pay attention to on the skate, but I want to mention that some people actually do wax this also. They'll put wax on the bottom of the depth stop and they will wax the actual skate body, track, whatever you guys call it, itself, okay? Um, I don't, but I also haven't done any experiments to see, you know, does it really make a difference or not, but you can let me know down below what you think about that. So, the three different things we need to look at. This is the knicker or the slitter, depth stop, 
I don't know what this is actually called, but I call it the skate stop screw. <laughs> because what it does, first off, when you are setting up combination plane with the second skate, I think it's the same thing for the small, small plow plane with the extension kit. You want the edge of this skate to line up with the edge of the blade. This right here lets you micro adjust how close or far that skate is from the blade by turning this screw. I can't show you how to set that up right now because we need to have the body and the blade in there first. So we'll do this part later. So let's look at the depth stop. Now, there's a couple different ways you can set the depth stop. You can use a ruler. You can use a tape measure, depth gauge, combination square, or my personal favorite, setup blocks. I like setup blocks just because they're easier, but let me show you these other methods. So say we want to set this to quarter inch. Take your tape measure. If it's super narrow, be careful because it can go underneath, turn it sideways and check. Now with the Veritas, this is something that I noticed while I was setting up this plane and practicing with it. This isn't always square to the bottom of the skate. I'm not sure if it's this one. I'm not sure if that's an error in them, but keep an eye out for that because when I was using my setup block, this side of the depth stop was higher than this side. So when you're doing this, check both sides and make sure it's where you want it to be. Tape measure, basically gonna be the same thing. The reason I don't like the tape measure is because the quarter inch is right here and it's hidden. So it's it could be easier for you to mess up and go to a different line if you don't, I guess, know the tape measure as well, I don't know. But you would take it, go like that, go like that, make sure it's where you want it. Depth gauge, same thing. Can't put it this way because it'll go under. You need to turn it sideways like that. Check one side, check the other side, make sure it's where you want it to be. Combination square. Those are a little bit thicker, so it shouldn't slide under. But if it does, just tilt it to the side. Make sure it's where you want it to be. Now, the reason I like setup blocks is because if we're doing a quarter inch, the easy thing you can do is just hold this here. If I put it in the correct hand, hold it like that. Loosen your depth stop, adjust this until it feels even all the way across. And there we go. So right there you can see. It's even all the way across. And then when you go set the other depth stop, you know it's gonna be exactly the same because you're using this piece. When you're using these, you're relying on lines. If you move something around, it might be a little bit higher, a little bit lower than the line before, that kind of stuff. But this is just personal preference. Um, I've had these for a long time and use them a lot. You don't have to get Veritas. There are other brands out there that sell them as well. Next, we want to look at the slitter or the knicker. Um, on the Stanley ones, they call it a knicker and the slitter is like in the back for veneer cutting. That's what I learned after the last video. So thank you guys for educating me because I didn't know what it was for. Now, for this, I'm actually going to take it out so I can show you a couple different things about it. So you get your little Allen key that comes with the plane. Don't lose that screw, and there you go. So here's the little slitter. Now you're gonna sharpen this like a marking knife, so let me show you that. So for this, I am using the 8000 mesh, three micron diamond plate. Um, you do not wanna go with a really rough stone because look how thin these things are. So these are really thin. You don't wanna go crazy. Um, I do have a higher stone than this one. It's the 16K Shapton, but I feel like it's just going to take a while because these have never been sharpened before. Now, when you sharpen these, you sharpen them like your marking knife. So these bevels are at five degrees. High chance you're going to have to do this freehand. I don't know of any jig that can sharpen these or sharpen marking knives. If you know one, let us know. Um, don't let freehanding scare you if you haven't attempted it yet. I have a whole video that shows you how to freehand. And this is going to be the same principle, just... A lot lot smaller so really you're just gonna be putting one finger here setting it down on the stone and finding primary let me see if I can turn it sideways without getting junk on my bench so you're gonna set it down at a skew find your primary okay if you're gonna do a micro bevel you go slightly up from there it's so tough to show you on camera um, yeah if you haven't seen that other video go watch that because that's exactly what I'm gonna do here set it down find primary slide it um, if you want to do a micro bevel, set it down, find primary, go slightly up. The other thing I want to mention, Richard Weil, I believe that's how you pronounce his last name. Richard, if you're watching this and I pronounce it wrong, I apologize. He wrote a sharpening book 
And in that book, he talks about actually rounding the tips of your marking knives over because they track better. If you have a super point, there's a chance that point can roll over, that, cho that point can break, or it can actually just follow into the grain of the wood. So when you round this over, it slices the fibers easier and it tracks better. Um, I highly recommend that book. If you haven't checked it out yet, Lee Valley sells it. I think, I don't know where else sells it. Um, I think it's just called The Sharpening Book. So check it out. I'll put a link to it down below. So for this one, to round the tip over, there's a couple different ways you can do it, but I really don't want you guys to stress on this. Um, all this is doing is creating a slit in the wood. It's just making a line like a marking knife, so don't get super duper technical and, and try to make sure that it's perfect and stuff like that. All I did to round the tip of the other one over is I just took it and went like that and rocked it back and forth. It's very, very slight. You don't need to be dramatic about it. You can if you want to. I think it still is going to work the same, but, but that's literally all I did was rock it back and forth. If you guys have a different way to round these tips, let me know. Let me test it. Yep. You got, I don't know if you guys can see that line. This is like a, this is just a Rockler bench, so I don't really care about it, but just go ahead and round that over. Really only the tip needs to be super sharp because you're not going to be digging this really far into the wood. So just sharpen that up. Make sure that it's sharp. Test it on whatever you want to test it, that it makes a line. And do that to the other one also because there's one on the body. I'm going to show you the body in a minute here. But since you already have this set up, sharpen the other knicker at the same time. The other thing I want to point out is don't mix them up because if you look, this bevel is not centered. I'm not sure if that like makes a difference or not. Doesn't seem like it does, but they're different. So I guess just don't mix them up. <laughs> now I should have meant that, mentioned this too. If you are not going to be cutting cross grain, you don't need that. You don't need the slitter or the knicker. You don't need to sharpen it right now. Um, but just so you guys have it. And so you know, if you are going to go cross grain, you wanna have this knicker just protruding slightly out of the bottom of the plane. So you loosen this. And then what I do is just take this and push it up. See in there? Okay. That's a little bit too far. You're going to want to push it back. I'd say right about there. See that? Tighten it down. It can't even be less than that, to be honest with you. Now, the next thing, this screw right here can push that knicker out or in. You want to line that knicker up with the corner of your blade. So again, I can't show you that right now, but just know if you're going cross grain and you're using the knicker, the tip of this needs to line up with the corner of your blade. If you have it too far, what you'll see is you'll have, oh, here, I can draw it. If you have the knicker too far out, say this is the groove that you're cutting, you'll see a line that the knicker is leaving, okay? If you have it too far in, Here's the groove you're cutting and you're going to get tear out because it's going to fall in here and this edge right here is going to tear out. So you want it to line up exactly with the, eye, the edge of the blade. So while you're cutting those grooves, the knicker is slicing those fibers for you so they don't tear out. I hope that makes sense. Next, we want to look at the body of the plane. Now, this is where the slitter or the knicker is on the body of the plane. So. This should already be sharpened if you sharpened it already. If you're not cutting cross grain, don't worry about it. But the same principle of this applies. If you are gonna be going cross grain, this one needs to be set at the corner of the iron. And I would recommend trying to get it as close to the same depth as the other slitter as possible. But I don't know that it makes that much of a difference. I just would hate for you to be higher on one side and it tilting the plane. You know what I mean? So try to make them even, but don't go crazy with it. Don't bust out any way to measure it. It's it's okay, eyeball it. All right, so now I wanna look at the depth stop on the body. You're gonna do the same thing. So if you're gonna use a setup block, ruler, whatever you're using, put it on there and get your depth stop where you want it, okay? What I wanna mention about this, we are currently measuring from the bottom of the skate. Your iron will protrude past 
the bottom of the skate because it has to, to take a cut. So it is not going to be exactly a quarter of an inch. That's what you need to keep in mind. Depending on how far past the bottom of the plane you have this, that's how far it's going to be off. Now, if you're taking lighter shavings, you really don't need to worry about it. If you're taking monster shavings, then okay, maybe. But if your project needs that level of accuracy, you should probably be an engineer. <laughs> because woodworking, I mean, we do get super accurate with things, but like that's extreme. Okay, with how far this is going to protrude past there to account for that. And I'm not going to worry about it. Next, we're going to focus on the iron and this part of the plane. So the first thing you need to figure out is which iron are you using? How, how wide is that iron? Because that's going to determine if you need this screw in or not. If you plan on using this like a plow plane and using narrow irons, you can just use this one skate and not include this one by just leaving this screw in. If you have an iron that is more than 3 8 this screw comes out and you use the second skate. If you leave that screw in, it interferes with the skate right about in here. So that has to come out. Now, the reason you do that is because if you're using a wider iron, the irons rest right here on both of these skates. See that? It also rests on this side. So if you're using a wider iron with one skate, that is not good. Okay, that's why if you look at the Veritas small plow plane, they tell you an iron bigger than 3 8 you need that wide blade conversion kit so the other side of the iron has a place to rest. Okay, I am going to use this iron, whoop, this iron right here. It is a 7 16th iron, so this screw is coming out. Don't lose it. There we go. So this blade is coming out. I now need to sharpen this blade. I am going to put a micro bevel on it and then I'm just going to take the burr off. You don't need to flatten the backs of their irons. They also recommend that you don't because this gray right here is like a rust preventative. So I'm going to get this iron sharpened up and then I'll be back with you. I figured I may as well record it. So I'm back to that 8,000 mesh, three micron, whatever with the window cleaner. And then I'm just going to freehand this. If you use a jig, that's perfectly fine. But all I do is I set it down, find the primary slightly up, sharpen. And then feel that you have a burr all the way across. I do see that little sliver. That's my micro bevel. That's all I do. And then just for the back, go like that. And that removed it. So now that iron is sharp. Yes, I just dug it into my skin. I hit my bracelet. Don't cut yourself. If you cut yourself, it is not my fault. But there you go. Sharp iron, ready to go. If you don't know how to freehand, again, I have a video on that. I'll put a link in the corner if I remember. All right, and we are ready to put the iron in the plane. Now, if you forget, whether it's bevel down or bevel up, a good school of thought. If this bed angle is high, it's going to be bevel down. If this bed angle was low, it would be bevel up, okay? I'm sure there are going to be some exceptions out there that I don't know about. Feel free to let me know, um, but that's what I do because I often forget whether it's bevel down or bevel up or whatever, but there you go. So put the iron in here. Be careful, not, be careful not to ding the edge at all. Now what I do is get it slightly tightened just so it doesn't fall out because what happens when I put this skate on, the iron tends to hit here and you'll need to loosen it and adjust it so the iron actually rests on there. So let me put the rods in and I'll see if it does it again so I can show you. If you guys have a better way to get the skates and the fences on there without having to shimmy it like you saw me, let me know. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll set it down and it'll just fall on its own. Um, but for some reason, this one didn't. These are loose. Yeah. I don't know. If you have a way to prevent that, let us know down below because I'm sure a lot of people will be curious. So slide this over and there we go. See how it's hitting the iron? Way off camera. See how it's hitting the iron like that? So what I need to do now is loosen the iron and adjust it to where there, that skate slides underneath. Then what I do is I push the iron down. So hold the iron down however you're going to and then tighten your cap, okay? 
The reason I say hold the iron down is because if you push down on it, it'll line itself up on this side. Wow. It'll line itself up on this side, and all you have to do is worry about this side, which is actually pretty close. This is where we use this skate stop. You're going to want to adjust this screw until the skate is lined up with the edge here, like this one is. Okay, so let me adjust this a little bit. That looks good right there, so I'm going to lock the fence down. And there we go, see that? I would say it's like slightly inside. I guess I shouldn't say lining up. It's slightly inside. I'm going to elaborate on this a little bit. Um, I was going to start talking about the depth, but for these here, these are your reference surfaces. These two skates right here. Once you start making the cuts, these need to be inside of the groove that you're cutting. If they're on the outside, you're not going to be cutting. So they need to be inside of the groove. So I say line these up with the corners, but it's a very, very slight, very slight overhang on the corners. Okay. So keep that in mind. I mean, I don't know if you'll be able to see it. It looks like it's lined up, but when you feel it, it's just very slightly overhanging on both sides. When it comes to setting the depth of the iron, there's a couple different schools of thought on how you do this. There's a couple different methods that you can do. Um, some people do the paper trick where they'll use a piece of paper underneath either in the front or the back and, and set it up that way. I honestly have not found a way that I like, that I prefer, other than just starting to take cuts and just seeing how thick of a shaving I can take, how thin I want to get, whatever, and just adjusting it on the fly like that. If you have a preferred method, explain it to us down below. Put it in detail of, I do X, Y, and Z, and then I go to town. Um, whatever you do, let us know so people can see other examples because I just like to adjust on the fly. That's about it. <laughs> so now, I want to put the fence on. Um, that's, that's very simple. I don't know that you guys need educated on that, but... Again, this is going to be one of those things that if you guys know how to prevent us from having to shimmy in it, let us know. Because the fence, I always seem to have to shimmy. Oh! Look, I just pinched my hand in there. That's staying in. I'm leaving it. All right. There we go. We got our fence on. We got everything ready to go. So let me get a board, and I will show this thing in action. All right, so this is a piece of Hackberry. Now, a little bit about Hackberry, just because some people might not have heard of it before. Most of the time, it's chopped up and, and turned into firewood. And I'm not really sure why, because it works kind of like a pine. It's harder than that, though. Um, I'd say it's kind of hard like an oak, but it works like a pine, if that makes any sense at all. Um, and it's beautiful, too. I mean, I have quite a bit of this, because the place where I get my lumber... He mostly sells to cabinet makers, and they don't like this for cabinets. Same with, like, Curly. So if you're looking for lumber, check for a place that mainly sells to cabinet makers because usually their Curly wood, odd wood like this, is a lot cheaper because the cabinet makers don't want it, and that's their main source of income. So this is just extra to them. That's a side note. Okay. When you are getting ready to use this plane, the first thing you want to do is set your fence. Now, you can draw your marks on here. You can use setup blocks to figure out how far away you need the fence to be from the skate or the edge of the blade, that kind of stuff. What I found it's easier for me if I just have a line, just setting it up to that. So I'm going to loosen the fence, slide it over. I went a little too far. And that's about right where I want it. So I'm going to tighten the fence down. And then I'm actually going to micro adjust because I need it just a little bit farther over. So I'm going to loosen the micro adjust. Righty tighty, lefty loosey. There we go. And I'm going to scoot it over just a bit. Right there. All right, and then I'm going to lock it down. Now, there's a couple different schools of thought for how you want to start this. Some people like to start it over here and have it be like a plow plane where you start at the end and work your way back. I've seen some people that actually just go for it. They start all the way. Um, get a little practice board and test it out a few different ways to see what you prefer and what you like. I've tried it both ways. I think I like starting here and working my way back. I don't know why. It just feels more comfortable to do it that way. So that's what I'm going to do. While you're using this plane, the most important thing is to try to keep it 
flat. So you want to put a lot of pressure against this fence. You don't need a ton of pressure down, but your pressure forward, because of the angle of this tote, is going to push the plane into the work. So that's going to help. Let me see my depth. Depth could be a little bit more, but nope, it's starting it. There you go, it's going to, I probably could adjust my depth. Let me do that. So, to adjust the depth, there is some play in whether you, when you advance and retract the depth adjuster. So just keep that in mind. So if you're going forward, if you need to advance, you're okay. But if for whatever reason you need to back up, make sure you advance this again so it's always in the advanced position so you don't get any kind of backlash. It's the same thing on like a bench plane. So loosen the cap slightly. Let's try that now. Getting some nice shavings, not too thick. The other thing about Hackberry too is it's stringy. So you're going to see these strings. That's not because of the plane. That's just the way that this wood is. Um, depending on what the project is going to be, sometimes I come back with just like a little marking knife or something sharp and take those edges off. Sometimes I put sandpaper. Don't stress on that. If you're using a different kind of wood that doesn't string, you'll be fine. I don't know that I've ever been able to work a piece of hackberry and have it not string. So just keep that in mind if you do grab some of this. See that one? I didn't keep the plane level. I tilted it. There you go. Just keep at it. Keep practicing with it. Like I said, get a scrap board. These strings are hilarious. Get a scrap, scrap board and keep working it to see what you like. Um, practice different things. Practice starting here. Practice starting back here. Now, when you get to the end of the board, sometimes it's tough. Like you might have this side really good where it's at the depth that you need and this side just isn't getting there. Sometimes what I find is I need to put a lot of pressure right here to start that cut. Break it off like that until you get it to the depth that you need. Mm. Did you see the dip at the end? So that is one thing you need to be careful of because there is a little bit of, see how these are raised up? So there's a little bit at the end that you have to be careful not to dip the plane forward because what you'll do is you'll have this side deeper than the other side. Something that I do too, and you guys can tell me about this, but I will leave sometimes like an inch on the edge of the board. So say I really only need this much of the board. I'll leave this much for those kinds of errors. If I'm going to basically snipe it out on this side or if I'm not going to get it deep enough on this side, I leave myself that buffer depending on how important the project is. If we're talking to shop furniture, I don't worry about it if it's a little bit off. But if I'm building like a nice piece of furniture or a nice box or something like that where it really matters, I leave myself that buffer and that room for error until I get better at using these types of planes. Um, so I definitely recommend trying that as well. Basically, you just keep doing this until it doesn't cut anymore because your depth stops will prevent it from stopping, or excuse me, will prevent it from cutting. See, I dipped it out again. Do you see that?
So, a correction to my last video. Those threaded screw holes are not for the jackrabbit playing fence. They're the same pitch and everything. I'm reaching out to Veritas to find out, like, why they're there. But if you put those rods there, you can only get a 1 8 inch cut depth before it bottoms out onto your workpiece. Now, some might say just to keep advancing the iron, but those rods then become your reference surface, which is going to tilt your plane. So, it doesn't work like I thought it would. And the funny thing is nobody else caught it either. So it's not just me. Everybody was just yelling about what well, doesn't make it a 55. I get it. Okay. So I am going to go back to that other video and cut that out because I don't want to confuse people, but I know a lot of people saw that part. So I just wanted to let you guys know, keeping it real. <laughs> so there you go. As you can see, this plane is not tough to set up. It's just a little time consuming if you're new to the plane. You got to give yourself the patience and the time to learn it. And that's kind of like any other tool in the shop. It's going to take you a little while to figure it out and get it set up how you want it. But then once you know that tool, setup is a lot faster. So don't let that part of it deter you from this tool. If you're like 100% hand tools, this tool might be a must in the shop for you because it does so many different things. If you're a minimalist, this replaces a lot of other planes. So... Keep that in mind. If you're a hybrid, which means you use power tools as well, you might not even want this plane. It depends on if you like using your router and router table and table saw to do the different joints and grooves and dados and everything that this plane can do. This plane can also do beading and fluting. I'm guessing there has to be router bits out there that do that, but still, the choice is yours. This plane does a lot. Don't let it scare you. If you've used this plane for a long time, whether it's the Veritas or the Stanley, and there's any kinds of tips or tricks or anything that I missed, please let people down, know down below so they can have that information as well. As always, if you guys have any questions, any comments, anything like that, feel free to let us know down below. Hope you enjoyed. Have a good day.